September 1st, 2013. My freshman year, I was beyond excited to start college, to be away from home, to be starting this new chapter. It was exhilarating. That night, I went out drinking with some people I just met. We were finally in college, and we were partying, and we were drinking and drinking. And before I knew it, we were in over our heads. I was separated from that group that night. I vaguely remember stumbling around the parties, barely able to walk, asking people how to get back to the dorms. I was alone, lost, and very incapacitated. And twice that night, I was raped. When I woke up that next morning, it felt like my world had shattered. I felt numb, used, ashamed, guilty, worthless. It felt like my light had been taken from me. I could take the rest of the evening to share my journey from waking up that morning to being on this stage tonight. What it was like to battle those demons for years. The self-hate, the panic attacks, all the unhealthy ways I tried to numb the pain. But tonight is not about me. It's not about the healing process. I want tonight to be about the one in five women who will be raped on campus this semester. I want tonight to be about preventing them from ever having to endure that. Rape is a crime that lurks all around the world. It affects so many demographic groups. Women, men, children, every ethnicity, socioeconomic class, sexual identity. It's happening in this country, in every country, every single day. It's disheartening to think about tackling a problem as monumental as this one. How do we fight it? Where do we even start? Well, I recognize that this is a global problem that affects more than just women. In order to fight it, you have to sink your teeth in somewhere, tear it down piece by piece. Because college women are five times more likely to be raped than the average American, and because it hits close to home, I'm choosing to start by fighting campus sexual assault. Through the lens of a survivor, I've seen the flaws in our approach to sexual assault prevention but I've also felt a great deal of hope for the future, for putting an end to sexual assault on campus. In the wake of the Me Too movement, the conversation is shifting. For the first time, there's less shame and more anger surrounding the topic of rape. Survivors are coming forward. It's time we break down the stigma of sexual assault and open up discussion on ways to truly and effectively prevent it. With all these people coming forward, the first step towards change is to simply believe them. Too often, these women are met with criticism. They're told that they're making it up for attention or to ruin a man's life. However, according to the Bureau of Justice Statistics, only 20% of women who were assaulted on campus reported to law enforcement, making it the most underreported crime on campuses. The National Sexual Violence Resource Center estimates that 2 to 10 percent of all rape accusations are false. This means that the majority of assaults aren't being documented, and the majority of those that are are true accusations. Chances are, when you have a woman in your life who is brave enough to come forward, she's giving you the very painful truth. Another barrier these women face is this idea that for rape to be legitimate, it's done by some stranger in a dark alley at gunpoint. It's violent, the law and order SVU type. However, according to a study conducted by the Kaiser Family Foundation, 70% of women who were raped on college campuses knew their perpetrator. Sexual assault isn't a one-dimensional crime. It's not just parking lots and alleyways at midnight. It's coercion at parties. It's taking a dress as a yes. It's assuming consent because consent's been given in the past. It's telling a drunk freshman you'll help her get back to the dorms, but you never quite make it there before you decide you're owed something. 
These women are then blamed for their clothing choices, substance use, who they're with, etc. Why are we so quick to point fingers at her? Why do we default to not believing and not empathizing with them? When did a woman's wardrobe choice become a statement of consent? This blame and this willingness to not believe victims stems from how we currently address sexual assault prevention. We've all seen the list floating around on Facebook. Tips for how not to get raped. Walk with your keys between your fingers. Don't wear headphones. Don't go jogging at night. Dress modestly. After a sexual assault was reported, my university sends out a list of crime prevention tips. Some of these include, do not walk alone at night. Visually scan your area. Do a full 360 to be aware of your surroundings. While these practices seem harmless enough, they put all the responsibility of preventing assault on the potential victim. These tips police women's actions to the point where they would no longer be living freely if they followed each one. It's not feasible to suggest that women always wait for a ride at night or for women to be hyper aware of their surroundings at all times. That's exhausting. That's not living, it's paranoia. Living in fear should not be the standard. This approach doesn't promote prevention. It just suggests how not to look like a target. Who can look less like a target? Who gets to be the four of five women who make it home safely tonight? What an awful game to play. Advising women on how not to be targets of sexual assault is ineffective because it doesn't address the root cause of rape. Rape doesn't happen because someone wore a miniskirt. It stems from an issue rooted deep in cultural standards. The pressures of masculinity and what it means to be a man in society today. To be a real man, one must be powerful, have a lot of success, and sleep with a lot of women. He must be dominant, aggressive, and emotionless. They're supposed to have this insatiable sex drive. They're praised for it. They're excused from their actions with phrases like, boys will be boys, and it's just locker room talk. Any feminine quality is deemed weak. Therefore, their female counterparts are seen as lesser. Femininity is used as an insult. You throw like a girl. Don't cry, man up. How are men to respect women and women's voices if they're subconsciously taught that women are not their equals? Therefore, a woman in a tight dress or a woman under the influence is not a person to respect, but rather an opportunity to assert that dominance, to score, to be a man. The prevention of sexual assault starts long before these students get to campus. It starts with what we teach our children. Forcing our boys into this man box where they aren't allowed to express themselves has to end. It's time we stop demonizing feminine qualities. Let your boys cry and express themselves. Don't use girly or doing something like a girl as an insult. Employing these tactics isn't setting your boys up to be men. It's just teaching them this internalized disrespect for women. As these kids grow up, we must have open and honest conversations about sex and proper consent. Anything other than a clear, sober, enthusiastic yes is not consent. No Means No Worldwide is an organization that puts these measures to practice. It's a course where boys and girls are taught mutual respect and how to intervene if they see a sexual assault occurring. The program is primarily used in Kenya, and they have seen a 51% decrease in the incidence of rape since implementing the program. It's effective because it teaches consent and respect at a young age, and it doesn't just churn out these prevention tips. In fact, changing these tips is another step we can take. As I mentioned, the, um, the list my alma mater sent out put a lot of responsibility on the potential victims. Several students from a gender studies class pointed out these flaws to the university, and the list has since changed to include proper definitions of consent right at the top. We must then remain vigilant on campus, not being afraid to step in and say something if a situation feels off, not entertaining conversations that degrade women or make fun of men for not fitting into that hypermasculine role. And above all, we must be passionate in our fight against sexual assault. 
The night after I was raped, I was in the hospital getting tests done to see what the damage was. I will never forget lying there, staring up at the harsh fluorescent lights because I couldn't bear to look anyone in the eyes. I remember how painful and intrusive the exam was. I remember just sobbing, wondering how anyone could feel so broken. But mostly, I remember my mom. I had all these burrs tangled in my hair because it happened on the ground outside. And as she pulled those burrs out, all she kept saying was, I'm sorry. Laura, I am so sorry. In that moment, that's exactly what I needed to hear. And I'm blessed that my family's been by my side through it all. But as I look back, I can't help but wonder how many women are going through this unspeakable trauma, and I'm sorry is where their justice ends. How many women are consoled with thoughts and prayers, but that is where our action stops. I'm sorry isn't good enough. Damage control isn't good enough. How much longer are we going to put Band-Aids on bullet holes and call it progress? We must take action before it ever gets to that point. Hold our boys accountable, teach consent and respect. It's the smallest changes that will have the greatest impact. You can't fix bullet holes with Band-Aids. So let's take away the gun. Thank you.